turn with me, read with me Ephesians 4, 17 to 32, um, as we're going to go through that together. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him, as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So then, put away falsehood. Let all of us speak the truth to our neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, for which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath, anger, wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's a, a, a quite a lengthy um, passage and so there's going to be a lot there that we can't cover today in the, the time slot we're given, but we're going to have a look at some of that. So this morning we're talking about authenticity, being authentic. I wonder how many of you knew that being authentic is part of Life Church's beliefs and values. It's listed there right next to our mission and values, even on our website. That means when we talk about being authentic... This is something that we seek to have running through our church veins. It's central to who we are. Authentic, in its definition, and I really like this, means of undisputed origin. It's not a copy, it's genuine. Just think about that for a moment. If you say you are authentic, that you are of undisputed origin and not a copy, that you are genuine... Who are you not a copy of? Of what origin are you? The title of Christians, and we'll come to this a bit more later, but the title of Christians was actually given as a, a nickname to believers, and it means little Christ. So when we think of that, being authentic, we we're just reflect on what that means for us and what that should look like. I wonder if you turn back to uh, me with that passage in Ephesians Four to seven, uh, four, 17 to 32. We're going to read through it uh, a few verses at a time and see um, what God has to say to you. And hopefully I can bring some light as well on, on that. So verse 17 to 19 says this. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greed, uh, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So this first bit where, where Paul's saying, um, now this I affirm and insist on the Lord. This is like his disclaimer. So he's saying, uh, essentially, hey Ephesians, right, this next bit that I'm about to say, yeah, this isn't optional. This is, this is like a must. This is central and pivotal to what we're doing because he's saying I insist on it in the Lord and I affirm it. That means it's expected of us. And that has to be the case for any one of us who is born again. The next bit is really interesting to me. It says, they, the Gentiles, are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. 
something that I've come to realize as I've, I've grown um, older and closer with, with Jesus through my walk is that real change only occurs when there is a connection between, in the knowledge between my, my heart and my head. And there is a, the behavior flows from that. So when I understand something and I start to think that way, that's when my behavior starts to change. And the world knows this because it's come up with a form of counseling and therapy called CBT. It's called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. It means that what we think about ourselves, how we think about um, others, defines so much about how we live. How many of us know that when we are born physically, that our minds uh, and our attitudes to the world are shaped by those who are most important to us? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where um, you do something or say something to someone and you just think, oh man, I, I just, I heard my mum and dad come out then. Like, oh, I just, when I said that, I could hear them saying exactly the same thing. And it's those things that, that really strike us then as to how much we are shaped by those around us, particularly at a young age. And it works at all levels. When we were born and the, wor uh, the world and our immediate surroundings started wiring our brain to teach us how we process information, how we deal with people. And by and large, we try and steer that well through, through our raising our children, through schools, through society. The, the society that has a um, Christian Judeo moral value basis that goes back hundreds of years that we take for granted that shapes us. My wife, Rebecca, and I are currently in a, a tough season with uh, our eldest boy, Ezra. Um, we're trying to teach him that hitting his brother is wrong uh, and that we, we tell him regularly to use his hands for gentle things. And so we re-emphasize re that to him on a daily basis. Um, but we're also teaching him that words are powerful. A few months ago, he started developing this whole string of things that he was, he was fearful of. Um, which is normal for his age, but he started becoming terrified of the dark where he wasn't previously, terrified of the hoover, uh, of loud noises, and some things that have no explanation, like sitting still in his high chair uh, when we're trying to get him to eat. You know, it's just all these things that he, he, start, he developed these fears of. And so Rebecca um, took the opportunity to start reinforcing with him these little phrases that we teach him, and uh, we started noticing like in the evening, he, he would start crying out when the light would be turned off. And uh, it's, it's a horrible feeling of distress. And, and Rebecca would go and, and kneel beside him. And she would say, Ezra, I want you to repeat after me. Because Ezra's great at that. He, he'll just repeat everything you, you say, which is a, both a blessing and a curse. Um, and parents will know what I'm talking about. Um, but she would say, say after me, Ezra's brave. And he'd be like, Ezra's brave. And she'd be like, no fear no fear. And we do that over and over again. And it would get to the point where after a few months, we would be sat downstairs or sat in our room and we would hear him say if there was something that had happened and he was starting to get upset or he was getting worked up, we could hear his little voice in the, the neighboring room and he would just say, Ezra is brave, Ezra is brave, no fear. And that, that starts the, the process on how we think and how, and how what we think shapes us and how we deal with things. But what I'm thinking at, uh, what I'm trying to get at, is that when we are born, we are born thinking a certain way. And Paul is saying, it does not matter what you knew. How you thought before, before Jesus, you previously were darkened in your understanding. How um, you know how the Bible says, you know, that the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. What that is saying is that it doesn't matter what you thought before, how you thought, how enlightened you thought you were. When we take Jesus into our lives, he changes our thinking and our, our whole mindset uh, changes. How could we have known before? Because we didn't know Jesus. Verse 19 carries on to, to 24, where it says, this is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him. And were taught in him, as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. 
So Paul, at this stage, has, has made his, uh, set the stage for his point here. Um, he's pointed to an old picture of the Gentiles. The Gentiles just means someone who is outside of God's covenant, who was a stranger to, to God. It's like the, the pre-knowing God uh, are Gentiles, and then uh, when he talks about either the, the Jewish people or um, those who are saved, he just means people who know Jesus. He says they're strangers from God because they were left to their own devices and practice everything that is wrong and impure. But he's doing it to say, you see that picture? He says, you see that old, the old picture, all those things? That's not you. He says, Paul, um, Paul says this is not what we were taught in Christ. And this point, if I'm honest, is a little bit of a rabbit hole. Um, because when I was writing this, there were just so many different avenues and so many different points that could be brought across. But I'm going to try and navigate down two um, today. Uh, and they're kind of like two sides of the, the same coin. And there is an identity that God has given us by his grace when we put our faith in him. And then on the other side of the coin, there is our response to that and the frequent reality of how we live. And if you've ever read, that side is more characterized by um, Romans 7. If you haven't read that, I recommend going and, and reading that after this. And that's where Paul says, essentially, to, to paraphrase him. He says, I know Jesus, but the things I, I, I want to do, I just don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Um, talking about our, our own sin and our failings. And so there's these two sides of uh, where there's what God speaks about us and the new identity he gives us and then how we live that out. Paul mentions both these things because he says twice, he says, you were taught this and this in Christ. So we know that some of how we learn to walk in authenticity is taught. Just like I teach my, my two boys to act a certain way, to recognize right from wrong, there is an element uh, in this process of, of walking in authenticity, looking like Christ, which has to be taught. This is the process that we're often really poor at in church, and it's called discipleship. And that's often because it involves uncomfortable conversations and challenging one another and saying, actually, that's not what Christ has seen in you, and that's not what Christ died for, for you to do. And it's a, a difficult one. But that's, that's called um, discipleship. The second part is really important, though, because Paul says that when we put away our, um, that we put away our old life and old, the old self, it's important for you to grasp that when you gave your life to Jesus, you left behind an old you. That's what baptism represents. It's the dying of sit to our sin and, and flesh. And then we come up out of the water, we believe in faith that we are born again. That means that there is an old self. Um, and it also means that if there's an old self, there must be a new self. And Paul tells us, what do we know about this new self? Well, he says it's made in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So there is an old you that died at baptism that is dead and buried. You can like, you know, almost look at it like, it's like one of those films where you see, um, the one that comes to my mind is like uh, Back to the Future, you know, where you're looking at your own grave, um, like when you're, when you're still alive. You can see in the back through baptism, there was an old you that's dead. But when you see what God says about you in your new life, he says that you've been made in the likeness of God himself in true righteousness and holiness. Now, this is super important to grasp. God is not a naive, love-blind parent. How many of you have, I don't know if uh, you've seen that there's loads of films, often they're kids' films where this happens, but like the one that comes to my mind is Harry Potter. And there's this character who's like Harry Potter, he's the main character, and he's got this cousin called Dudley. Um, and Dudley is this selfish, obnoxious, spoiled child who is mean and cruel to Harry. Um, but there's like this caricature of the love blind parent where it doesn't matter what the child does, like they could be obviously bullying someone and being mean, but the child's like, the parents are like, oh no, not my little angel. He's, oh no, he wouldn't do that. It must have been something else. God's not like that. That's not how God sees us. When he says that, uh, speaks his identity over us, he doesn't suddenly become blind to, to what we do. But what God sees in us when we accept Christ, him, uh, what God does see is Christ in us, rather, when we accept him into our lives. He sees who he created us to be through Jesus and how his grace and love, uh, and by his grace and love, we can be transformed. But this is the key. 
it isn't authentic, it isn't an authentic walk with God to live how we used to and seek to be and not seek to be transformed into the person that God has said we should be. Just ask yourself, if you know God, our our Father has called you to be loved, to be holy, to be pure and righteous, why should we desire any less for ourselves? We need to listen to the voice of our Father and allow what he says about us to become our reality. Paul says that we need to clothe ourselves with this new self. So we need to clothe ourselves with that likeness of God that is holy and pure and righteous. And clothing ourselves is something that we normally do daily. And I think I'll just let that one sit for a moment. We do that daily. That's something that we have to practice and do intentionally and be conscious of. So we'll just quickly recap. We have our identity. This is the new us, how God sees us. And let's remember the definition of authentic, the genuine, not a mere copy. That's you of a thing. It's not a copy of a thing. So when you said yes to Jesus, you became something new that had never been created before. You were paid for and are of undisputed origin. And I really love that phrase when I saw it, undisputed origin. Do we know that? As in head to heart, do we know our origin? Is it obvious to others as well? When God sees you, there is no doubt you are his. We are not called to be like the pastors or the person next to us. We're not, we are a new creation that the Holy Spirit um, and, and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. You're not called to be a mere copy of someone else or someone else who you think is good and righteous. And then there is our part of the walk that is taught. Because as parents, um, uh, many of you will be parents, some of you who, who are not, but will know children and, and understand this situation where you can often see gifts and talents in children um, that exist uh, it, just by who they are. So when God sees us, see it, there are things in that new self that he has gifted us with and he can see them, but we can't always see them ourselves and they're not always there unless they're developed and honed and we bring them out. With us, we have to grasp both sides of this because we're not talking about salvation by works. We are not under an old covenant, which means that it doesn't matter how good I am, how kind or loving I am or how saintly I am. There's nothing I'm going to do that's going to save me because I'm saved by an amazing, loving father who gave his son to die for me. And there's nothing that I can do to um, supersede that. When we die in baptism and and, uh, rise again in true life with Jesus, there is a physical and a spiritual change that happens that has nothing to do with you and everything to do with God. God sees you and the work of his son in you and what he has called you to be. But as Paul says in the next few verses, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by then responding to that grace, by clothing ourselves with the new... um, by clothing ourselves with an old identity um, that Jesus uh, died to um, take away and to give you a new identity. So verse 25 says this. So then, putting away falsehood, let us speak the truth of our neighbours, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. And that's always a a challenging one, isn't it? But only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words might give grace to those who hear. There's a high standard set there that I just want to point out. And I'm not saying I live up to that, far from it. Um, But it's just interesting to note. And verse 30 carries on. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath, anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. So Paul continues that vein of thought. 
Um, he said so far, you were one way and now you're another. Therefore, and he is starting to challenge the behaviors that contradict the identity that Jesus has given them. I just want to ask you a question. It's kind of rhetorical because I think most of you will know it. Um, what are the, most, the two most important commandments that are given in the Bible? Jesus says the first one is love the Lord your God with all your ma- uh, heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second one is love your neighbor as yourself. And that last bit is the bit I want to focus on. It's actually split into two bits. So it's love your neighbor. And, you know, the first commandment, you know, love the Lord your God. You're like, okay, yeah, I can do that. I've fallen in love with Jesus. Great. Then it's love your neighbor. That's a little bit more more challenging. As you love yourself. If the self that you're loving is full of sin and resentment, bitterness and pain, how do you think that impacts us loving one another? if we love ourselves that way, if what we love is filled with something that we shouldn't love. It may sound, this next point may sound a bit self-absorbed, but it's true. And I want to remind you this today that God is calling you to fall in love with yourself. Or rather, he wants you to fall in love with who he made you to be, with what he has spoken over you, to fall in love with the spirit that dwells within you, the Holy Spirit. Because not only does it fix the first problem about loving your neighbor, but it helps when you are in love with what you know Jesus has spoken over you um, because it removes the desire to go and dig up the corpse that used to represent you. So often when we meet Jesus and are born again, we go through that honeymoon period. But when it's over, we look back at our dead selves and think, hmm, There's there's some parts of that that I'd quite like. And we've got that we've put on this new self and and then we we look at the the corpse, the the deadness that we that used to exist in us, and we think, well, we forget about the how it made others feel or how we actually looked, but we think, oh, it was very comfortable, wasn't it? And we we go and we go and dig up what is dead and what Jesus has said that's dead it's gone it's no longer your identity but we go back and we we kind of we pull out stuff and we put it on and we feel oh it's well there's comfort in that because it's it's what we're used to but the way that we stop that the way that we sever ties with that past is because we have to be so in love and so enraptured by what we see jesus has called us to be and what he has spoken over us that we don't desire the things that we had before can I just put on a little side note here? If, um, if you say that you know Jesus, but you continue to live like you used to, that may be because change takes time, and that's okay. Um, God is a loving and patient God, and that is that's okay. But if you don't feel a desire to change or be different to how you used to be, can I suggest that when you really encounter Jesus and see how he sees you and feel that love, you can't help but want to change? And maybe if you haven't changed, check your heart that it's not the church that you said yes to and fell in love with rather than Jesus. Because the church is a substitute or can form a substitute for Jesus where we we love falling in love with the church and with community and, and with people's acceptance. But that's not Jesus. When we love Jesus and we encounter that, we can't help but change. It brings out and births in us something that desires purity and holiness in the same way that when you, when you meet someone like the love of your, your life, when I met Rebecca, meeting her made me want to be a better man because I wanted to be a person who was worthy of her and I wanted to, to show her what I could be. And meeting Jesus should be no less the same. It, it should be, um, it should stir in us something that desires to be changed and to be made pure and holy because when we see God that's what we see so we don't make space for the devil that's uh, the next part of that verse the enemy is uh, the one that sought to bring death into this world so as far as he's concerned if he can get you to go back and waste your time on things that are dead and irrelevant then great so what he's saying is when we when we speak those things don't give room for the devil 
Paul continues and says, it's on the, it's on the final point, home stretch now, guys. Paul says, we should not grieve the Holy Spirit, which we do when we go back to those old things. Um, a, a dear friend of mine, um, a lady who most of you will probably know, called Wendy Brett, is one of these people where um, she will often, when you're having a conversation with her, she'll often like say something and she'll be laughing like, ha ha, like, and say, I don't know, I'm, th throw like a comment out there. And because she's laughing, you kind of think, oh, this is a joke. And then it hits you that she's one of those people that, that does that, but then you realize she's dropping like these cold, hard truth bombs, and you're just like, oh, oh, right. All right, okay, that was, that was for me, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. And then conviction hits, and then you're like, yeah, okay, that's a fair point. And she's done this to me loads, like in the past. She, she's, she's brought up stuff, um, and it's always on, on point. But one of the things I, I like she said to me before was she was like, when we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, just like Paul says, we are sealed with his mark, the maker's mark, if you like. And that we take the Holy Spirit everywhere we go with us. So it's not like he just like comes and, and goes. The Holy Spirit is dwelling within me and it's dwelling within you when you said yes to Jesus. Now, just think about this. If the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you, you take him everywhere you go. You take him into the good situations, but he's also there every time you are in the office and you're gossiping about someone. Every time you are saying something that is mean or unkind or not building someone up, he is with you at every point. Now, at no point in that, like it says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. He never stops loving you. But I fail to see how that can't grieve the Holy Spirit and cause pain. It's like if you had someone going with you, if so you were allocated in life, like the ultimate life coach, the Holy Spirit's called our comforter. Um, if you were given the ultimate life coach, the guide, and all you had to do was learn to listen to him, and he would help you in every situation in life. So every time you're feeling a bit nervous about something, you'd be like, uh, what should I do? And he was just like, if you follow my instructions, you're going to win at life. Can you imagine how it would make him feel if... Then at every point, you're just like, yeah, I'm kind of going to ignore that you're here and continue to sort of slag you off behind your back. That, that's got to hurt. And so actually, we need to be living with an awareness. And this is part of where it's taught. We need to live in an awareness that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And Wendy's great at reminding us for that, because whenever you do something, she's just like, the Holy Spirit's here with us. And he's, he's in this conversation, too. So we should just bear that in mind. As I close, we're going to do a, an activation. It may be that uh, you've done these before, but I want us to take a step together as a church because it is important that we sever some of those ties together as a church. Um, it's important that when we preach stuff like this, we don't just then uh, leave it. And what we want to do is we want to, we want to make a declaration as a church. We want to step forward in agreement with what the Holy Spirit wants to do. So I'm just going to read again this last section of the verse. It says, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. We're going to pray a prayer in a moment as we close and ask God to take off any old clothes that we may have dug up or are trying to cling on to. And we're going to ask him to give us a, a love for him and for who he has called us to be, because it's important that both individually and collectively we know and we, we speak over ourselves that we are called to be the beautiful, pure and holy bride of Christ. So just wonder if wherever you are, if you could just put out your, your hands in front of you, make yourself ready to receive. Sometimes this is difficult, and trust me, I know, I really know. Sometimes there are parts of ourselves that we know God wants to deal with or wants to get rid of, and it hurts. It actually physically hurts to say, God, I give that over to you, because we know that the change requires pain. And there's a whole other thing about change that we could preach on, but we, we won't go into to that right now. But Father... We know that you have called us to be holy and pure because that is what you are. That's the identity you've given us. And we recognize that first in ourselves, Father. We just ask that if, if we haven't recognized that, if we haven't understood the full measure of how you see us, that you would give us that revelation, Jesus. And Father, we repent for having held on to some of those old parts of ourselves, for trying to dig up the things that you have said were buried and done when we died to sin 
and we rose again with you in Christ Jesus. Father, we, we ask for your forgiveness. And Father, right now, we want to do an exchange. We just want to say, Father, we give you all our, our old clothing, the things that we have dug up. We put them back in that grave. And Father, we just ask that you would seal, seal that grave, Father. Seal the door with your blood. And Father, we say we no longer want to go back to the way things were. And we want to fall in love with who you have created us to be. Jesus, I just thank you for the weights and the burdens that you have taken off people right now. Father, I thank you that you are a God that, does, that loves us enough to not leave us as we are, to not just leave us in our, our pain and our sin and the, the habits that cause us perpetual pain, that cause the issues that we encounter in life because you have called us to freedom and to life in abundance. Father, I just pray right now that where people have taken off those clothes, taken off those, um, the old mantles that they used to carry that were of their old selves, Father, that you would clothe them in righteousness and holiness. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you.